All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Physics Meets ML on November 4th. Hope everyone is doing well. And I hope that uh, this talk is a wonderful insertion of some physics into the middle of your day. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So it's a pleasure to have Ana Diaz Rivero from Harvard, uh, who is graduating and getting her, getting her PhD this year. Uh, she is a cosmologist, and she has been doing some very cool work on machine learning for cosmology. Uh, maybe it's probably worth saying at the beginning uh, that for people in the machine learning community or broader aspects of the physics community, uh, cosmology has had a remarkable amount of data come in in the last few decades. When I started graduate school in the, in the late 2000s, uh, it was emphasized to me just how much progress there had been that sort of in the 60s and 70s, it was sometimes regarded as a little bit of a joke in the physics community that cosmology was sort of on the same footing. But then so much data came in uh, that the story really changed. And based on that data, we have a fairly accurate picture of uh, what happened at different phases in the universe's evolution, including in the very early universe. And so with all of this data in hand, there is a question of what is the best way to analyze it. And Anna is an expert on that. And uh, it's going to be great to hear about her work today. So uh, Anna, please take it away. And uh, you know, if there are questions, feel free to post them in the chat or ask them after. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for giving me a chance to talk a bit about my work. Uh, today, I'm going to be focusing on a paper uh, that my advisor and I uh, put up uh, just a couple months ago, um, in which we were interested in understanding whether we could use some machine learning, in particular flow-based generative models, to um, you know, try to help in circumstances where perhaps Gaussian approximations for inference are inadequate. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. As a, um, uh, I know that this is a very broad physics audience. So let me start uh, by giving you a bit of an overview of what cosmology is as a field and, you know, some of the issues that we're worried about and motivate the type of work that I'm going to be discussing for the remainder of the talk. So in a nutshell, um, you can summarize cosmology with a figure like the one that I'm showing on this slide. We have this very detailed understanding of really how the universe evolved from just a tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And we think that it looks something like this, where you know there was this Big Bang, there's this hot over density, and there were some tiny quantum fluctuations that then got stretched to you know, observable scales uh, by a process called inflation, where the size of the universe just increased dramatically. And we can see these tiny fluctuations imprinted in, in observables in the universe. So the first time we're able to actually see them, they appear as tiny anisotropies in what's called the afterglow of the Big Bang, or more form formally, the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB. Um, and you can see like tiny anisotropies in the temperature, for example, so some hot spots, some cold spots. And the idea, what we think happened is that, you know, as time goes on, these tiny anisotropies evolve and they grow due to, you know, the effect of gravity. Um, and that eventually results in all the structure we see around us today. So all the galaxies, for example. Um, so this is, you know, at a high level, kind of what we think happens. And we actually have a parametric model for all of this, for the, like the universe itself. It's called the Lambda Cold Dark Matter Model. And it, that's kind of the standard cosmological model. And cosmology is kind of a, a special science in the sense that we only have one universe, right? We can't rerun this experiment many, many times and see what happens. We only have one universe and we have to make do with that. But we're very fortunate in that we can uh, probe different scales and different times in cosmic history to obtain independent estimates of these model parameters. So some examples are shown here. This CMB that I talked about, so the, this kind of afterglow of the Big Bang, we can look at statistical patterns in this field of photons to uh, constrain these model parameters. We can look at the distribution of galaxies all around us to constrain these matter parameters. We have ways of probing the expansion history of the universe. And we also have predictions to what that's supposed to be in the lambda cold dark matter models. So we are able to, you know, obtain independent estimates in, um, through different ob observations. And as Jim mentioned, uh, we're in a very special time in cosmology where, you know, over the past decade or so, we've really obtained a humongous amount of data. And we're in the so-called era of precision cosmology, where now we can measure parameters with very, very, very high precision, like really at the percent or sub-percent level. And to illustrate just how far we've come over the last 20 years, I took this figure from um, one of the most well-known uh, CMB collaborations that just had their final data release a couple of years ago, where they show for seven different cosmological parameters, it doesn't really matter what they are, just for seven different cosmological parameters, 
how much the statistical weight, which they define as one over the variance of that parameter, has improved in time. So for every single parameter, bluer colors correspond to, you know, data coming earlier on in time, whereas the red, the, the more to the left, the redder colors correspond to more recent data releases. And you can see that the statistical weight has increased by, you know, over two orders of magnitude in some cases. So we really are obtaining very, very precise measurements of these cosmological parameters. And one thing to note that's interesting to keep in mind is that these model parameters are not predicted from theory. Okay, we have to infer them from observations. There's a little asterisk here because there is one that's predicted from theory, but I'm not going to be talking about that specific parameter. So just keep in mind that, you know, for everything that I'm going to be talking about, we're really talking about, we don't know anything about what these parameter values should be until we measure them, uh, ma like make a measurement and then infer parameters from those measurements. And as I mentioned, you know, we can obtain measurements from different types of cosmological observables. And if we do that, we find amazing consistency between our universe and this model, the Lambda CDM model. And just to illustrate some of this, you know, phenomenal agreement, I'm showing three different types of uh, observables. One of them corresponds to the expansion history of the universe, where the model prediction would be, you know, this black line or the black line shown over here. You can see in the residual that the agreement is really, really, really good. Again, looking at the cosmic microwave background on isotropy, so these like you know tiny fluctuations that we see in that, and for example, the temperature field, you can see the agreement between the model, which is uh, shown in like it's kind of hard to see, but it's this like dashed uh, gray line, and the data agrees really really well. And same thing if we look at the clustering of matter, where the lambda CDM model prediction is this this black line, and then you can see the data overlaid on top of it, and the agreement is really really good. But that's not the end of the story. So if we look at individual data sets, as I did in the previous slide, we see really, really good agreement right, between the model and the data. But if we actually compare some model parameters between some of these data sets, we actually see what we call tensions, statistical tensions between the values inferred uh, for these model parameters from different observables. And I'm showing here two types, or like the two most well-known tensions in cosmology at present. One is the H0 tension, where H0 really just measures the current expansion rate of the universe. And the other one is called the SA tension. And this parameter SA, you can think of it as measuring the growth of structure in the universe. And there's a really interesting uh, pattern that we see in both of these tensions, where the tension really arises when you compare um, measurements from the early universe. So for example, from the cosmic microwave background, and then measurements from the late universe. And that happens for both of these, right? So it happens for the H0 tension and it happens for the SA tension as well. And so that's really intriguing. And it's unclear whether this really, you know, is pointing to a flaw or an incompleteness in the model that we have to account for. And just to give you an example of how much this can matter, how much of a revolution this could really entail, remember that, you know, when Einstein came up with general relativity, there was that one tiny anomaly in the precision, precision of Mercury's orbit, right? And that's all it took to really, for it to turn out that we needed a whole new framework, we needed general relativity to come up, uh, you know, to kind of replace uh, Newtonian gravity. Um, and here we're seeing like, you know, much more significant tensions in the data and people are really interested in understanding whether these really point to new physics or not. We take a slightly different point of view on this issue, which is, we ask the question of whether cosmological parameters are really as accurate as they are precise. Because if it turns out that there's something in the way that we're inferring this parameter that is affecting the accuracy, that is you know, biasing these parameters, then it might be that the tensions we're not, that we're seeing are not actually indicative of new physics, but rather indicative of a flaw in which we're inferring the model parameters. There are of course several key ingredients in any statistical inference pipeline shown here. There's three primary ones, the data, the model, and the likelihood, and in Bayesian, in a Bayesian setting, you also have a prior, of course. And there are a lot of factors in each of these ingredients that are going to determine the quality of the parameters you infer, right? Both in terms of their accuracy and in terms of their precision. And you might want to look into any of these, but for the remainder of the talk today, I'm gonna to be focusing on one of them, namely the likelihood and looking at how um, you know, using a wrong likelihood can bias parameter inferences and how we can essentially try to overcome that limitation. So the likelihood is something that we, we all know, but let me just define it a bit more formally. A likelihood function measures the extent to which a sample, a data sample provides support for a particular uh, set of values in a statistical model. 
And a lot of modern statistical inf inference relies on a likelihood, right? This shows up in many different shapes and forms, maximum likelihood estimates, likelihood ratios, posteriors, uh, base factors, all that sort of stuff. So it's a very, very important um, ingredient in our statistical inference models or pipelines. And in cosmology in particular, Gaussian likelihoods are very, very widespread. They're of course very well understood and they're simple. You just need a covariance matrix to do the inference. Because of the central limit theorem, we, you know, we expect it to apply in many regimes, even if the likelihood itself isn't truly Gaussian. And I've just taken some snippets from the literature to really illustrate like the ubiquity of this likelihood in cosmology. Uh, so from CMB collaborations to collaborations that deal with, you know, galaxy clustering and the distribution of galaxies in the universe, it really is very, very common to use this approximation. But the point that I want to make is that there are some limitations, at least in cosmology, um, where, you know, perhaps it's suboptimal to be using Gaussian likelihoods. For one, the central limit theorem isn't always applicable. In cosmology, we often deal with power spectra. And you know, at small wave numbers, you don't have very many modes in your going into that specific um, K bin, for example. And we know that the central limit theorem does not apply in that limit. We also know that for cases where we have to estimate a covariance matrix instead of you know kind of driving it from first principles, you technically have to marginalize over the two covariants. And this marginalization step actually turns a Gaussian likelihood into a T distribution. So even if your data likelihood is actually Gaussian, if you have an estimate of the covariance. The, the true likelihood that you should be using for inference is not itself Gaussian. We also know that there are systematic effects that can introduce non-Gaussian correlations and we're not always aware of you know, 100% of the systematic effects in our data. So that's something to keep in mind. And finally, we can also use some knowledge of the underlying physics that gives rise to a cosmological observable to understand whether the Gaussian approximation is valid or not. Just to give you an example, the cosmic, the cosmic microwave background itself is essentially a Gaussian field. But um, you know, galaxy distributions that we see around us today are not, right? They're the product of a hugely nonlinear uh, process of structure formation for all cosmic time. Um, so there's um, quite a difference in the Gaussianity of those two fields that you have to keep that in mind as well when you're thinking about the likelihood to apply to each of these two observables. And the point that I want to drill is basically that um, using a wrong likelihood, so for example, using a Gaussian likelihood to infer parameters from non-Gaussian data really is a source of systematic uncertainty. And it can bias parameters inferred from some data if the non-Gaussianities are significant enough. So the question that we're interested in kind of motivating all our work is whether the tensions that we see in cosmology are being created or at least amplified by the use of wrong likelihoods. The problem of course is that there isn't always a clear alternative or a better likelihood, right? If there were, people wouldn't have to rely on a Gaussian likelihood in settings where they know it's suboptimal. And I've taken two examples from the literature from pretty different cosmological observations that illustrate kind of this, this struggle and not really knowing how to, how to handle it. Um, and the one in the top, they essentially resort to Gaussianizing the data. They know, okay, we, don't, we know our data is non-Gaussian. We don't have a non-Gaussian likelihood. Let us Gaussianize our data and just use the Gaussian likelihood. And then the one in the bottom, they take a slightly different approach uh, where they, they kind of quantify the non-Gaussian of all their data. And they say, well, let us remove the most contaminated points, and by contaminated, I mean the most non-Gaussian points. Uh, but of course, that's not, that's not optimal since you're getting rid of a lot of your hard, you're getting rid of a lot of the, the data that you, know, you worked really hard to obtain. So what I'm gonna be talking about today are what I'm gonna be calling data-driven likelihoods, although they appear, they appear with different names in the literature. These are essentially likelihoods that are learned from the data in the sense that you don't have to fix their functional form at the outset of the problem you essentially train on a bunch of data, or you fit on a bunch of data, and that kind of determines the functional form. Although they do vary in their flexibility, and I'll be talking a bit about that. The underlying idea behind data-driven likelihoods is that you can think of data or mock data as independent draws from the underlying true likelihood. So if you have enough samples, uh, then you can essentially estimate the data's PDF, right? And the hope is that by using something more flexible than a Gaussian, so by using something whose functional form you don't have to impose yourself, you can actually accurately capture the non-Gaussianities in the data and thus remove this source of systematic uncertainty that I talked about a couple of slides ago. As our baseline, I'm gonna be uh, using two data-driven likelihoods. One are Gaussian mixture models and the other is independent component analysis. And these are pretty well-known um, techniques. So I'll just quickly go over them. 
So in Gaussian mixture models, you essentially have a combination of, of Gaussians. Um, they're essentially each given a weight and they each have unknown means and covariances and you can solve for all of these parameters. Of course, you wanna make sure that it's, you know, it still normalizes to unity when you integrate the entire PDF. And uh, typically to solve for these parameters, you use expectation of maximization and then to obtain the optimal number of components in your mixture, you use the Bayesian information criterion just to make sure that you're not overfitting, right? Obviously, as you add more and more components, um, your fit is gonna like seem to be better but you might just be overfitting. The other data-driven likelihood that I'm going to be uh, talking about is going to be independent components analysis, or ICA. And this is very common in, um, in literature that's um, interested in, for example, removing foregrounds or stuff like that in cosmology, although the setting is obviously different. The main underlying assumption in ICA is that your data X is some linear combination of some sources, where this linear combination is given by some mixing matrix uh, called A. And in independent components analysis, the name of the game is basically projecting the data into principal components, uh, widening it, and then rotating the principal components to maximize the statistical independence. So what you end up is your source is a combination of um, n individual uh, components, where n can be the, the full dimension of your data, or you can also use it for dimensionality reduction. In our specific case, we're never gonna be using it for, for dimensionality reduction. So we're always gonna have the same amount of components ICA components as we have in our original data vector. And then once you have your N individual components, you can use some you know, density estimate method. We use a kernel density estimate method to, to have you know, uh, PDFs for each of the components. And then the total PDF is just going to be a factorial distribution, which is a product of the N individual components. And the reason why we're using these two data-driven likelihoods as our baseline is because there was a paper a couple of years ago that used these two um, to try to assess the impact of non-Gaussianities in large-scale structure observables in cosmology. And they found pretty small shifts, so half a sigma shifts, when using um, Gaussian mixture models for one type of observable and ICA for another type of observable. And I'm pointing out the amount of data um, and the types of observables and the types of DBLs that went into, into this analysis because I'll be coming back to it over and over again during this talk. But what we were interested in doing was, well, for starters, understanding whether these two methods, Gaussian mixture models and ICA, were, um, were appropriate, whether they were really capturing the non-Gaussianities correctly. And if the answer is no, trying to develop a more robust and more flexible method to do this. And we ended up coming uh, up with what we ended up publishing, of course, which is what we called flow-based likelihoods. And what I'm going to do is, I'm not sure how familiar people are with flow-based generative models, although they have been gaining quite a bit of popularity recently. So I'll just spend a few minutes talking about those. And just uh, for those of you that might already be familiar with it, just know that what I'm going to be calling a flow-based likelihood is basically the optimization objective, uh, so the loss function of these models. And I want to emphasize that um, you know, flow-based generative models have gotten quite a bit of traction in cosmology recently. And so if you're interested in the sort of work that I'm going to be talking about today, you might want to look into, um, into things like simulation-based inference or likelihood-free inference that also make use of these sorts of flow-based density estimation methods. So um, let me, as I said, just quickly talk about flow-based models. A generative model, very simply, you can think of it as a model that wants to learn a probability distribution of some data such that you can generate new samples and thus their name. And in flow-based models, there is a very interesting class of generative models where the name of the game is essentially to learn a series of transformations. Okay, so what you have really are some data samples, which I'll call X in this case. Oh, and let me just, as a disclaimer, this is obviously just a very simple toy example in one dimension, but we're gonna be doing this in many, many dimensions. Anyways, so what you have is some data samples X and your goal is to learn what P of X is. So the, you know, the PDF of your data. Um, and what you're actually going to be doing is playing a very interesting game where you start with a very simple distribution. So for example, a Gaussian, and we'll, we can call this the prior space or the latent space, whatever you want. And what you want is, is to learn a series of transformations that um, take you from this very simple distribution that you control and you understand very well to the quote unquote complicated true PDF of the data. And this series of transformations is what it's called flow and what gives these models their name. And let me emphasize two things about this figure. For one, you can see that there's two different directions, right? There's the green arrows, which correspond to the training direction, 
and then the blue arrows, which correspond to what I call the generative direction. And this is because, you know, in the training direction, you have to go from right to left because what you have are data samples. And so the way that you start off this problem is kind of learning the inverse of the transformation. You start by learning how to encode X into this prior space Z. And if you're clever about the way you, trans you build these transformations and you make sure they're invertible, then once you learn the transformations in the green direction, you can just invert them to go in the blue direction. And then you can just sample something from your prior, which you know, you know how to sample something from a Gaussian, and then make that sample undergo the inverse of the transformations you learn to generate a data sample. Mathematically, you can see it as follows. In the generative process, you start from drawing um, some sample Z from your prior distribution, and then you make Z undergo a series of transformations until you get a data sample X. And you can see that essentially, um, at each step in the transformation, you essentially, you can think of it as a change of variables, right? You, you have some intermediate variables and ultimately the total transformations in each direction is just a composition of each of the transformations, which are just inverses of each other. So you can obtain an X in terms of Z or you can obtain a Z in terms of X. And the interesting thing about this procedure is that you end up with a, an analytical expression for the final log likelihood of your data in terms of the prior, which again, you choose and you know what it is, you control it. And then an additional term that accounts for this uh, concatenated, concatenated sequence of change of variables. So you have a term for the log determinants of the Jacobian of this transformation, which I've shown here as the total Jacobian or also perhaps more intuitively um, as each of the individual change of variables that take place in your chain of transformations. So the goal of course is to train a model to learn these transformations. And in particular, neural nets can come into play to make them very, very expressive if they're involved in the transformations. And then the loss, so what you're actually using to optimize uh, the network is going to be the negative log likelihood over the, training, uh, over the training set, of course. And if training is successful, then the learned likelihood is the true data likelihood, which is what we've been calling a data-driven likelihood. And there are some things to keep in mind, right? Um, not everything is magical and things come with a price. For starters, you have to be very careful on how you construct these transformations. You need them to be invertible, of course, so you can go in both directions in that little figure that I showed. And you also have to make sure that calculating the determinant of the Jacobian isn't some huge bottleneck, right? So calculating a determinant usually scales as n cubed. Um, so you have to be really smart in the Jacobian that you, that you have uh, from your transformations in order to make this easy. And of course, these two things are going to limit how expressive uh, your model is. There are different tips in the literature to, uh, to achieve this. Um, you know, you can restrict the form of the transformation and exploit some identity so you don't have to um, like brute force calculate the determinant every single time. You can also be clever in the types of transformations you do include to make sure that the Jacobian, for example, is triangular and then calculating the determinant is a lot easier. And for, it depends on, of course, what your goal is. But for what we're gonna be talking about, we really want the process in both directions. So both in the density estimation process and in the sampling process to be very quick. And let me just show you um, a couple of examples in the literature in case you're interested in these models. This is a figure taken from a flow-based generative model called GLOW from a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, it's kind of the canonical application in the machine learning literature to try to learn, uh, teach a model how to generate uh, human faces. And you can see that they're, I mean, they're pretty good, right? It's really high resolution, very crisp images. There are some weird features with the hair, but it's, you know, it's still really impressive. And then some interesting papers that are more recent in the literature applied to cosmology and astrophysics in particular, uh, one of them being this like likelihood free inference that I mentioned earlier, in case you're interested in looking at these types of models. But the one that we ended up uh, opting for is a model called Fjord. And it's different to kind of the most commonly used one. So at least in cosmology, it's very common to use a class of flow-based models called uh, masked autoregressive flows or MAFs. Um, and that was suboptimal for us because as I mentioned, we were really interested in being really fast in both the density estimation and sampling processes. And autoregressive models generally have a bottleneck at one of those. So Fjord has a huge advantage in that it's really fast in both of those directions. And it has an additional um, benefit that I'll talk about shortly. So Fjord also as a physicist is kind of interesting because you see the transformation from your prior space to your data space as an evolution in time. So you see the prior as a kind of your initial conditions 
and you're trying to solve for this time evolution. So um, the way you do this, of course, is you, again, you parametrize kind of this ODE with a neural network and they have some really interesting um, results in their paper, which is when you have this sort of continuous normalizing flow instead of a, instead of a discrete series of transformations, the, the determinant has turned into a trace. And so that's already a lot faster to, um, to calculate than a determinant. And then you can, just like before, you can write the final log likelihood in terms of the prior log likelihood and this term that, that accounts for the, for the transformation. And they use some stochastic trace estimators to actually even reduce the complexity even more. So instead of having order n cubed uh, complexity for, for a calculation of this equation, it's actually order n. So they don't have to restrict the transformations in the same way that other, that other models do. And then to being really, really fast. And that's why we ended up opting for this model. And I took this little animation for their GitHub just because I thought it was kind of cool uh, where, you know, they trained them on this target, which is, looks like a cat or something of the sort. And you can see how his training goes by. You start with a white Gaussian and you can see how it kind of gets transformed into the final distribution that you want. And it's just a kind of a very cool um, kind of depiction of what's really going on in these flow-based models. And before moving on to you know, the actual cosmological data set that we were interested in, we ran some tests on toy Gaussian data. So we were interested in understanding basically when people talk about um, samples generated from these models, whether there was uh, you know, a strong correlation between the sample quality and the likelihood quality. Because if, you know, if, the, if the likelihood that you're recovering is completely biased or something like that, then it's completely useless for our intents and purposes. So we compared um, you know, some data, which is shown in light blue here, to a flow-based model that was trained on this toy data. And you can see that the samples, which are shown in red lines, match the data very, very well. But more than that, we wanted to understand whether the likelihood was accurate, as I mentioned. And we were able to show that in cases for non-singular covariance in your toy data, the flow-based model did essentially as well as it could have. It recovered um, the true likelihood to within sampling error, which is exactly what we wanted. But we actually showed, perhaps more interestingly, that in different regimes, so for example, if you have a singular covariance or you're not very careful and you don't know whether your covariance is, is singular or not, your samples might look just as perfect as they did before, right? So you can see the agreement between uh, the toy data and the samples is still amazing. But now when you compare, uh, when you compare to the likelihood, it's the, the answer is completely off. So you can now see that the flow-based samples shown in red have a huge scatter and are not really centered on the true on the true likelihood, um, so you have you know both a scatter and a bias. And it was just interesting because oftentimes we we we've read papers that just talk about like the quality of likely of of samples generated from these models, and we just wanted to show that it's not necessarily a good sample doesn't actually correspond to to a correct likelihood. But anyways, uh, once we kind of looked at our at some of this toy data, we moved on to what we were really interested in, which is non-Gaussianity, right? And in particular, looking at non-Gaussian cosmological data. And to be able to test how these models did, we had to come up with a way of quantifying non-Gaussianity. And we ended up coming up with a series of three tests to quantify the non-Gaussianity in a data set. The first step or the first test is very straightforward. It's just a t-statistic of skewness and kurtosis for individual bins in the data, where of course the null hypothesis is, you know, if the data is Gaussian, um, and in that case, that would be zero for the skewness in the excess kurtosis. The second step is using the transcovariance matrix. Uh, this terminology was uh, coined in a paper a couple of years ago by Elena Salentin, who's worked a lot on this, on this sorts of non-Gaussianity type of work in cosmology. And the transcovariance matrix is an interesting object that essentially accounts for the non-Gaussianity between pairs of data points. And the underlying um, principle behind it is very simple and very interesting. The idea is that if you have two independent Gaussian random variables, their sum will itself follow a Gaussian distribution with a new mean and a new variance. And in particular, if you widen your data before carrying out this addition procedure, the distribution of this random variable S should be a Gaussian with a mean of zero and a variance of two. So what you can do is for all your data, for all your data points, for each bin in your data, you can calculate the distribution of the sum between bins and then look at the deviation between that distribution and the expectation if the data were Gaussian. And this is called the mean integrated squared error. And you know, if you do it for each pair of bins, you actually end up with a, with a matrix and that's the transcovariance matrix. 
And you can take it one step further to simplify it. And you can essentially sum over the columns of this matrix to end up with a measure of the total non-Gaussian contamination for each bin in the data. And I'll call this epsilon plus. And the final measure that we use to identify non-Gaussianities is using um, an estimator, an estimator for the Kale divergence. In particular, we're going to be comparing the Kale divergence of the data with respect to a Gaussian or a multivariate normal, uh, which is what this MVN means, and comparing that to the Kale divergence of a multivariate normal with itself, right? right? So if the data is truly given by a multivariate normal, then the Kale divergence we obtain uh, comparing the data to a Gaussian should be consistent with the Kale divergence of a multivariate normal with itself, which is kind of like our on our null test, if you wanna if you wanna think about it that way. And the Kale divergence is something that again we're all very familiar with, but just you know, we use a specific estimator of the Kale divergence, which is a k-nearest neighbor estimator. And I'll be talking um, near the end of the talk. I'll be talking a bit about how you know the volume of data um, is important for this estimator, since you know k-nearest neighbor algorithms obviously suffer from the curse of dimensionality. Um, okay, perfect. So I've now gone a bit over our method. So we know we're going to be using these three data driven likelihoods and we now have a way of quantifying, quantifying non Gaussianities. So for the remainder of the talk, basically the name of the game is going to be applying these three tests to a set of mock data and looking at the different ways in which the non Gaussianities can manifest themselves and then generating samples from the three different data driven likelihoods that we're interested in to assess whether each of them has actually successfully captured the non-Gaussianities in the data. So the data that we're actually, that we're gonna be using um, to test this pipeline is weak gravitational lensing data. Let me, again, since, the, since this is kind of a broad physics um, audience, let me just quickly summarize what this data actually is. So, uh, you know, strong gravitational lensing, I think, is something that a lot of people have heard about. They give rise to these so-called Einstein rings that are uh, often talked about. And, you know, you can um, find these beautiful images of uh, essentially galaxies whose light gets distorted massively when their light passes by a very massive body. And it could give rise to these like huge distortions and even multiple images of the same object. In contrast, weak gravitational lensing, as its name um, kind of gives away is a much more subtle effect. So you don't get these huge distortions or these multiple images, but you get slight changes in the shapes of galaxies. So in this particular example, you can see that the original galaxy is a perfect circle. And when you actually observe it, it has a bit of an ellipticity. And the idea is that, you know, because there's a lot of structure in the universe, for galaxies that are far away from us, as their light travels towards us, the path of the photons is going to be ever so slightly deflected by all the intervening mass that they encounter along their path. So when we observe them, we actually observe them with these like tiny um, kind of distortions in their shape. So, you know, weak gravitational lensing surveys look at statistical correlations in the shapes of millions and millions of galaxies. The idea is that, you know, if you, if this is the original distribution of galaxies and I place, for example, a mass over here, you can get something like this. This is hugely exaggerated, just so you know, just for illustrative purposes. And then you can get correlations in the shapes of galaxies. So you can see, for example, all of these galaxies have the elasticity pointing the same direction. So if you map enough galaxies, all this is a very weak effect, you can uh, kind of try to recover statistically this effect. And so um, to be able to do this, we of course had to simulate this weak lensing data. So we use a publicly av available um, Python software for ray tracing called lens tools, where essentially what you have to do is run a bunch of n-body simulations for any choice of cosmological parameters you want. And then when you have these three dimensional distribution of mass, uh, what you can do is like slice it up into two dimensional planes and then combine planes and do some ray tracing to try to reconstruct what some of these uh, mass density fields look like. And that's what the convergence is. It's just a fancy way of calling, you know, projected surface mass density. And if we follow this procedure of, you know, running full end body simulation, slicing it up and so on, we end up with um, surface density maps that look something like this. Where you can see there are some over densities and these correspond to like very massive objects in the universe. And there are also a lot of under densities. And in particular, we summarize each convergence map, which has you know, many, many thousands of pixels into a power spectrum. Uh, mathematically, the power spectrum is given by this equation over here. You can see what you basically do is you take your field, you project into harmonic space, 
And then you take the coefficients of the spherical harmonics, which are called the ALMs, and you square them. And that's how you end up with a convergence power spectrum. And here is the, here on the left, this is the actual distribution of power spectra that we use to train our model. And let me emphasize just a couple of points about the power spectrum and why it's an interesting observable. For starters, you know, if you start off with a fully Gaussian field, you know that the projection into a harmonic space is a linear function. And so your ALMs are gonna be themselves Gaussian distributed. But of course, as soon as you square them, this nonlinear operation is going to mean that each bin in your power spectrum is not gonna be Gaussian distributed. It actually is going to have a gamma distribution. And this is true not only of this convergence field, it would be true also for the CMB. The additional complication comes from the fact that the convergence field is not itself Gaussianly distributed. It's actually non-Gaussian itself. So the ALMs th themselves are non-Gaussian distributed. And you have an additional important effect, which is the fact that you, uh, what you actually measure in the sky are just discrete tracers. So what you can actually map are galaxy positions, right? You don't have access to the true underlying mass distribution. And the fact that you have only discrete tracers to calculate the power spectrum also adds in some additional skewness. And that's why this observable is so interesting because it, it really has a lot of different sources that give rise to non-Gaussianity. And it's kind of hard to predict from first principles really how all these different non-Gaussianities are going to impact the final observable. So the first step is to look at our mock data and see how the different non-Gaussianities manifest themselves using our three different tests. So remember that the first test was the t-statistic of the skewness and the kurtosis for individual bins in the data. And that's exactly what we're showing here for the skewness on the left and the kurtosis on the right. Um, so the, green, the gray contours in this figure correspond to Gaussian samples. So what we do is we, you know, we go to our mock data, we can take the mean and we can find the covariance of our data. So as if we assume that it were Gaussian, and then we can draw Gaussian samples from that data. And that's what this, what these gray contours correspond to. And as you, as you would expect, and as you would hope, um, they correspond to a t-statistic of one and two for the 68th and 95th percentiles respectively. So that's all going well, you expect that. But when you actually compute the t-statistic per bin for the actual data, so not for the Gaussian samples, you see huge deviations from Gaussianity. So you see that basically for all the bins in the skewness and for a lot of the bins in the kurtosis, you are significantly above a t-statistic of two. The second measure was this transcovariance matrix, which essentially looked at the non-Gaussianity uh, between pairs of data points. And on the left, this is the transcovariance matrix for the actual data. And in the middle, this is the transcovariance matrix for Gaussian samples. Again, you take the mean and the covariance in the data and you, and you just draw a bunch of Gaussian samples. And notice that the color bar in these two matrices is the same here and here. So you can just by eye see a huge difference in the structure of the matrix in the data compared to the one that you obtain for the Gaussian samples. And if we look at the epsilon plus measure, which remember is just summing the columns of this transcovariance matrix, you can see this difference uh, you know, very easily. The, 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 this epsilon plus measure for the Gaussian samples is shown here in gray. And you can compare it to the one you obtain from your data, which is shown in red. And you can see that there's a huge difference. And if you look at the mean of these two, of the, you know, of the red crosses versus the gray points, there's actually a factor of eight difference between them. And the vertical offset is precisely an indication of the non-Gaussianity in the data. And the final test that we look at is the KL divergence, which is essentially a measure of the non-Gaussianity uh, as a whole, you know, in your entire observable. And remember that what we wanted to compare was essentially we take some reference distribution. So for example, a Gaussian likelihood, and we compare the KL divergence of Gaussian samples with themselves as a kind of reference distribution. And that's shown over here in gray. And if our data were Gaussian, we would expect it to be consistent with this gray histogram. But what we actually observe is this red histogram over here. And this horizontal offset is again, an indication that there's some important source of non-Gaussianity in our data. So we then went ahead and trained a flow-based uh, general model fjord on these convergence power spectra. And this is uh, this figure taken from our paper and kind of shows a bit what's going on as the training is, is taking place. In the top row, we're essentially comparing the likelihood that the model gives to the likelihood that a multivariate normal uh, would give for a given test set sample. So if the model is predicting something Gaussian, all the data points should lie on this green line, right? That's a one-to-one -one line. And the test set samples are shown as these little blue scatter points. 
And you can see that at the beginning of training, so after the first epoch, the points very much lie on this on this green line. So the 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 model hasn't really learned anything interesting. It's kind of plateaued at a local minimum given by this multivariate normal. But you can see that as training goes on and on and on, you start seeing bigger and bigger deviations between the test set uh, likelihood that the model gives and the Gaussian likelihood. And by the time we finish our training after 75. 75 epochs, you can see quite a big difference between the learned likelihood shown in these blue points and the expected likelihood if the data were Gaussian. And you can also see that reflected in the loss, which is shown in this, in this uh, bottom series of panels where you know at the beginning kind of plateaus in this local minimum of the Gaussian likelihood. And you can see that as it escapes that plateau um, and kind of starts encountering the non-Gaussianities in the data, the likelihood starts decreasing and decreasing and decreasing until of course it converges and, and, and we stop training. And remember that I made a point about the, you know, sample quality and likelihood quality. So we were interested in looking at for the three, for the three um, data-driven likelihoods that we're looking at, what the samples look like and then what the, the residual looked like between what the model predicted and what that specific data-driven likelihood gave us. Oh, sorry. So um, in each row, we're looking at one of each of the three data-driven likelihoods. So in the top row, this is the ICA likelihood. The middle row is a Gaussian mixture model likelihood, where there's a two here because using the Bayesian information criterion, we found that two was the optimal number of components. So that's why it's called GMM2. And then the final row corresponds to our flow-based likelihood. And if you look at the samples, you know, they all look pretty good. So the light blue contours, again, correspond to the actual data that was used to train the model, whereas the, the red contours correspond to, you know, the, the confidence levels we get from drawing samples from the likelihood. And for all three models, it looks pretty good. If you look at the residual, it's also kind of hard to draw a conclusion. You can see that they've all captured some degree of non-Gaussianity, right? So they all have some deviation from the expectation from, you know, from the multivariate normal likelihood, uh, but it's kind of hard to kind of parse out what the differences really are between these three models. So uh, what we can then do is, as I kind of foreshadowed a few slides ago, is we can draw samples from each of these three data-driven likelihoods and look at the three non-Gaussian measures to see if each of them accurately captured the non-Gaussianities. And in this figure, again, each row is going to correspond to each of the three data-driven likelihoods, ICA, Gaussian mixture models, and FBL, flow-based likelihoods. And each co column corresponds to one of the one of the non-Gaussianity tests that, that I described a few slides ago. So in the first row, we're looking at the ICA likelihood. And just like before, you know, the, the gray contours correspond to Gaussian samples drawn from the mean and the covariance of our data. The, the blue contours um, correspond to the, to the actual mock data. And then the red contours are going to correspond to samples drawn from that data-driven likelihood. In this case, these correspond to samples drawn from the ICA likelihood. And if you look at the skewness in the kurtosis, the t-statistic of the skewness in the kurtosis, you can see that the ICA likelihood um, manages to capture the, you know, the first two or three bins for both of these measures, and then doesn't really capture any, anything above that. So as you go to higher and higher multiple numbers. If you look at the transcovariance matrix or, you know, to be easier, just the epsilon plus, which is the sum over the columns of the transcovariance matrix, you can see that the IC likelihood completely fails at capturing that type of non-Gaussianity. So this is what the data uh, actually has, and this is what the ICA model um, gives you, and you can see there's a huge disparity between them. And if you look at the KL divergence, the gray and the red histograms are the same as I showed before. So this is, you know, we would expect a true likelihood to be consistent with this gray histogram, whereas you know, with a Gaussian likelihood, we obtain something like the red histogram. And if we now add an additional histogram where we compare the data to the ICA likelihood, we show that here in green. And you can see that although it's shifted slightly to the left, so you know, you've slightly bridged the gap all the way to the gray histogram, there's still a really long way to go when you use the ICA likelihood for this observable. We then look at the exact same uh, three non-Gaussianian measures for the Gaussian mixture model. We now see kind of an opposite picture where the skewness and the kurtosis are not well captured by the model at all, but the transcovariance matrix measure is actually captured very, very well. There's near perfect overlap between the data and the samples drawn from the Gaussian mixture model with two components. And if we look at the kale divergence, now the story is quite different. You can see that the green histogram, which remember corresponded to comparing 
mock data samples to samples drawn from this likelihood is almost perfectly consistent with our reference sample. So that's telling you that the Gaussian mixture model is doing a pretty good job of capturing the non-Gaussianities. But then we can look at the flow-based likelihood that we, that we train using all our mock data. And you can see that it does even better than either of these other two. So it does an extremely good job of capturing the skewness and the kurtosis, except it does miss some of the skewness at the very, very highest multiple bins. It does a really good job of capturing the, the transcovariance matrix. Again, perfect overlap between the data and the samples drawn from the flow-based likelihood. And if you look at the KL divergence measure, now there's a you know, perfect overlap basically between the reference gray histogram and the green histogram, which is exactly what we wanted to see. So there are various implications for, for you know, what, we, what we showed in our paper slash what I've talked about in this talk today. For starters, we showed that for our mock weak lensing data, both Gaussian mixture models and ICA failed at capturing the different non-Gaussianities. Um, you know, some were Gaussian mixture model was successful in some, ICA was successful in some, but conversely, the flow-based likelihood did a lot better for all three measures that we looked at. And one of the points that I want to emphasize that uh, maybe in hindsight is obvious, but was surprising to us is that, you know, data volume is not the only thing that is going to determine the success or failure of a data-driven likelihood when applied to a given data set. Having some understanding of the types of non-Gaussianities present in your data is going to be crucial to select the right model. And a perfect example of this is ICA, which we found was inadequate for the non-Gaussianities across bins. So remember that you know, it was able to capture the bin-wise um, non-Gaussianity when it was significant enough, but it did not do a good job of capturing these um, measures of non-Gaussianity that looked at you know, non-Gaussianities between pairs of data points or with the data set as a whole. And again, in hindsight, this might be obvious because the main assumption underlying an independent component analysis is that you're trying to maximize the statistical independence between the ICA components. So you're destroying all of these non-Gaussian correlations in your data. The point being that if there are significant non-Gaussian correlations in your data that might have useful cosmological information, then if you're using an ICA likelihood, you are completely ignoring all of those. And another point to be made is that, you know, the flexibility of the flow-based likelihood precisely because of the fact that it doesn't require like very strict assumptions, like the, you know, the requirements of statistical independence in ICA, it can preclude you from having to use some sort of trial and error procedure. Like if you're not sure the types of non-Gaussianity in your data and you try different types of data-driven likelihoods, that can be kind of time, time consuming and kind of a random process. And the flexibility of flow-based likelihood can really avoid you having to do that. As an example of this, um, I took a, a, a couple of figures taken from the paper that I mentioned early on that used Gaussian mixture models and ICA likelihoods for large scale structure observables, where they very much had to do this trial and error procedure. For a same observable, they looked something slightly different to what we're looking at. They looked at, at the galaxy power spectrum and they tried to, they used this scale divergence measure that I've been talking about in this talk. And they found that, for example, when they used a, a Gaussian mixture model, they were completely unsuccessful at capturing the non-Gaussianities. And when they used an ICA likelihood, they were successful. So this is just another, aside from what I showed you before, another example of how you can, you know, if you have data-driven likelihoods that are more flexible than a Gaussian, but perhaps not flexible enough, it might be kind of hard to understand which one is appropriate um, for your specific data set. But I do want to make a point that data volume is obviously important too. So as with every machine learning model, you know, for the flow-based likelihoods, we have a lot of parameters. We have around 13,000 parameters. So you do need to have enough data to not overfit your model. But more than that, you know, the volume of data also matters for the non-strict deep learning methods. So um, we wanted to show that, for example, if we restrict the quantity of data we have drastically, so for example, we use 2048 mocks to kind of emulate the work that had been done here for the galaxy power spectrum, then our ICA as well. So not only the flow-based likelihood, which obviously could not be trained with 2000 mocks, but the ICA likelihood itself struggled a lot more. So in this kind of data starved regime, it wasn't even able to capture the non-Gaussianity at the very you know, most non-Gaussian bins, which it was able to do when it had a lot more data. And the data starved regime also mattered um, in a, at another part in our analysis. So the Kale divergence that I measured, remember I, I said that this was a k-nearest neighbor estimator, and we actually find that if we use very little data, it's kind of a, 
not so robust estimator, we were able to show that depending on the random seed you have, you could even for data that is, that is supposed to be completely consistent with each other. So in each of these panels, the, the orange histogram and the, and the blue histogram are both um, kale divergence estimates of multivariate samples with multivariate samples. So you should expect you know, a near perfect agreement between these two histograms. You can see that depending on the random seed, you can actually find quite a lot of disagreements. So you know, for some random seed, um, you could have as little as 18% overlap, or you could have as much as 60% overlap. So just to emphasize that the data volume is a, a big ingredient to keep in mind, and of course could be a big limitation depending on how expensive it is to either gather data or simulate mock data. And I want to wrap up by mentioning that you know, weak lensing is, has been particularly interesting because remember that I mentioned that you know, it does have some significant non-Gaussianities. We know they're there, and we know they're there even on scales where we're not dominated by cosmic variance, which is just a fancy way of calling sample variance if you want to, if, if cosmic variance is a term that you're not familiar with. So that's, of course, something that we're very interested in. And the non-Gaussianity in this data set is particularly interesting because weak lensing data is very involved in these tensions that I talked about. So um, when you're comparing the early universe and late universe measurements and you're seeing big discrepancies in the parameters inferred, weak lensing data is some of the, the you know, late universe measurements. So it's very important um, in the resolution of these tensions to understand the non-Gaussianities in this specific observable. It's also uh, important to keep in mind that as we were surveying the, the literature, you know, as our results started coming in and we had a bit of a better understanding of the non-Gaussianity in our data, and you know, how important it could be when you're inferring model parameters, we noticed that there were a lot of um, procedures in the data that either purposefully or accidentally Gaussianized the data. So for example, there, are, there were works that would combine bins before inferring parameters and then claim that the non-Gaussianity was not, was not important and non-Gaussianity wouldn't shift parameters. But of course you can't really do that because by construction you've removed the non-Gaussian information. There were also examples um, that accidentally kind of have procedures that might Gaussianize the data. And those are also suboptimal. And to illustrate this plight, I took a little snippet from, uh, from a different observable in cosmology called the thermal SZ 1.0 PDF of a paper that essentially talks about um, a regime in which they were forced to Gaussianize the data, but they know that this is suboptimal because in doing so, they are, they are essentially getting rid of useful cosmological information. Just to make the point that while you can Gaussianize the data and then you know, use a Gaussian likelihood and that's technically correct, you might be removing a lot of useful information that might help us in this quest to understand what's going on in the tensions for the data. And finally, when it comes you know, very specifically to the shortcomings of ICA, we were interested in this because we have seen works in the literature that in the context of weak lending, specifically use ICA as a sort of pre-processing step. Um, and then conclude that again, non-Gaussianities do not have an important impact in the recovered parameters. But of course, we now know that ICA essentially does not capture most of the non-Gaussianities in the data. So by using ICA as a, at any point in your pipeline, you are erasing a lot of this information. So then you can't really claim that the non-Gaussianities um, are not going to have an important impact in parameter constraints. And with that, I will, um, I will open up the floor for any questions. Excellent. Anna, thank you very much. That was a beautiful talk. So we will take questions for Anna. Feel free to unmute yourself or uh, ask questions in the chat. While those are coming in, I'll go ahead and maybe ask the first one. So um, definitely a strong takeaway here is for, for me is, as you know, someone who's interested in cosmology, but more from sort of a string theory perspective is that these Lambda CDM model, this, this model that we use so regularly, um, because the constraints are coming from different time slices in the evolution of the universe. If you get the likelihood wrong in one of those time slices, you could just have discrepancies due to using the wrong likelihood rather than, rather than any new physics. Um, and I think you've sort of um, argued here that in, in the case of the parameters related to weak lensing, this could be a really important effect. Um, uh, String theorists love talking about the Hubble tension, amongst other things, uh, but that's more, that's more supernovae than weak, weak lensing, right? Can similar considerations come in there and potentially resolve the Hubble tension, you think? Yeah, so well, the Hubble tension has an additional very interesting subtlety, which is that when you look at, let me, let me go all the way back to the Hubble tension. Um, well, the answer in general is yes, right? Like there are some regimes and I'm at all not 
uh, like an expert on these types of data uh, at all. Um, but let me just say a few words about it. Um, so when it comes to like- Your talk's not about, sorry about that. No, I'm... no, it's okay. It's like, I mean, it's super interesting. Yeah. So when it comes to analyzing CMB data, you know, it kind of, a lot of the principles that I talked about today in practice also apply like the, you know, what multiple you're at is going to determine how Gaussian or not Gaussian it is, blah, blah, blah. But CMB collaborations are super careful with that. So like they have different likelihoods for the lower limit, the higher limit, so all that sort of stuff. So I don't think there's, too much to be gained from like um, doing something like this with non-Gaussian for the for the CMB. Huh. Maybe yes, because there are some interesting tensions within CMB data. So potentially yes. Um, when it comes to the late universe measurements, I'm not sure actually. I don't think so because they have a lot of data, um, like individual ways of calibrating this. They have a lot of data, a lot of objects that they use for this distance ladder. So I would assume that you're in a slightly different regime where the Gaussian approximation is a lot more valid. Mm -hmm. And the subtlety that I wanted to mention that is really interesting is that at least when it comes to some of these measurements, so for example, the, this blue error bar, the shoes collaboration, that's not an inference, it's a determination of the H naught tension. So when you're looking at a measurement like Planck, sorry, Planck here, um, there you essentially have to assume lambda CBM and kind of extrapolate to get H naught. So that's a model dependent thing. Whereas this blue error bar is not cosmology dependent. Obviously it has some other model dependencies and like things that you have to account for, but it's a determination. You don't have to assume lambda CDM to obtain it. So there's some really interesting additional subtleties to the H naught tension. So then questions of, you know, using the light, right likelihood to make sure that you uh, infer lambda CDM parameters correctly for shoes, that's just not the relevant thing to talk about at all. I think is the Again, I'm not an expert. I would assume, I would assume no. I would think maybe for something like, so this red error bar, the holy cow collaboration, that um, comes from time delay measurements of lens quasars. And there may be, because there the likelihood is, it's a lot harder. It's a lot more intractable. There are a lot more parameters and nuisance parameters that you have to take into account, I think, when you model these systems. So that could potentially be a, an interesting target, but I'm not completely sure. I see. Um... Well, thank you. Uh, one more quick question, if you don't mind, based on based on you know, the, the details of your talk. I think it, you implied it, but I just want to make sure that you know when I see these discrepancies between the Gaussian uh, mixture models versus uh, the flow-based likelihoods, for instance, for for, for example, the the KL uh, histograms were beautiful, and it was clear that things were working better using your guys' techniques. Um, but I, as someone outside the field, I don't know. Does that sort of discrepancy in the likelihood really? Uh, transform into a, a meaningful significant deviation in the inferred parameters in lambda CDM or I don't yeah, know. That's, yeah. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, I just I, I just don't know how, how that translates and sort of to like an end game conclusion as far as lambda CDM goes. Yeah, yeah that's um that's exactly what we're working on now. I see. <laughs> so cool. we will have an answer soon. Cool. So so like at, at the level of you know properties of the likelihood itself, it's clear that the, that these are much better, but but then you guys want to know how much does that really affect parameter inference. Yeah, and I mean, we think it's going to, you know, it can have an important effect because you're essentially affecting these tails of the distribution, yeah. right? You can have fatter tails and those can have big differences, uh, like big impacts when you, like if you ignore, you know, fat tails or you include them. So we think that it's going to have some effect. The question, whether it's enough to bridge like a two sigma gap, um, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate you answering the questions. That I'm sure gave uh, people in the audience also time to think of their own questions. So feel free to uh, uh, turn your video on and unmute yourself and ask a question. Hey, I had a very similar question to Jim actually. Um, so maybe maybe you cannot say more on this, but so a less ambitious question would be if you if you observe these um, this de deviation from Gaussianity as you did there, would it be would you be able to at least say in which direction sort of the tension would be moved or some some observable parameter would be shifted or would you have to just rerun the analysis with this new prior and then see what you get or is there is there some way of just knowing from de you deviating from Gaussian in this in this way you your observables will change in, in a certain direction. Yes, and let me, do I have the backup slide? Yes, yeah, so I can show this backup slide. And the answer is in principle, yes. So like, so weak lensing observables are skewed in a very particular direction. 
Um, this is not exactly what I was looking at. So this is the, the real space two-point correlation function. So kind of the real space analog of everything I've been talking about. But if you look at different bins, you can see there's also the skewness, right? You can see it also in this histogram over here. And you can see that essentially it biases parameters low. And that's intriguingly um, like what exactly what we're seeing in weak lensing. So just to first order, just looking at the fact that, you know, um, these are skewed to the left, then that is kind of in the direction that we want it to be in order to be able to explain the tension. Uh, but that's just kind of like a um, uh, kind of high level argument. We haven't proven it yet by actually running it and showing that that's the actual impact it has. It's just the expectation based on the skewness of the distribution. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Anna? There's a question in the chat. Uh, and the question is uh, uh, from Daniele. I don't know if they're still here. Uh, if so, maybe you can unmute and ask. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, you don't, I will ask it. Yes, I'm here. And the question is, uh, in the flow-based modeling, how does the entropy of the, of the distribution vary in the subsequent steps? I'm sorry, Thank the you. what? It's about the entropy of the distribution in subsequent steps mm -hmm. when applying the model. I'm thinking about uh, something like um, the entropy choosing a preferred direction to choose in uh, modeling the distribution. I'm not sure. Sorry, I wish I had a better answer. I'm, I'm not sure. That's not something that we looked into. OK, it's fine. <laughs> Sorry. I will say that like everything, all of this is going to be when we, like the paper is published, um, all the code is going to be available online with the parameters and the model train. So anyone can feel free to look through it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Anna? Hi, I had a, just a quick question about the this kind of continuous normalizing flow that you're using. Uh, what is like, uh, I, I, know, I feel like it hasn't been as popular to, necessarily to use this for, for mm -hmm. the, the image data set that you use is, is not one of these like um, ODE flows, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering what your experience was using this. And I know like in some cases there, there's an argument that it, it, there are some distributions that can't capture it because it has to learn this ODE, right? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically my experience, at, like at first it seemed a lot more complex than anything else. So it definitely was not our first choice at all. And we actually started off using a lot of these um, models. We assume that you know we're not modeling an image with millions of pixels. We just have this like 37 dimensional thing. Like we thought that maybe some of these like affine transformations like um, a real NVP or glow or something like that would be good for this. And we actually found that it, we did not recover good likelihood estimates with it. Um, some of the more popular ones like um, you know autoregressive models we didn't want to deal with since they're really slow. Like for example, in generating samples and like part of our model validation procedure requires generating a lot of samples. So obviously that was suboptimal for us. And we had honestly like, so the Fjord code is written, is publicly available. I didn't have to write like this ODE solver. And I actually found it to be like extremely robust. Like I tried on a lot of different like toy data sets and actual data sets or like mock data sets and so on and so forth. And I had, um, yeah, we, we had like a really easy time like optimizing the model. Um, it was very successful at with anything we threw at it. Uh, I'm not sure why it isn't quite as popular as others, but to us, it far outperformed anything else we tried. Thanks. Anyone else have questions for Anna? Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, a beautiful talk. Um, I'm not a cosmologist, so uh, what I wanted to ask is if the transformations that you're working on, are they unique? 
you in the sense that oh, there's only one transformation which brings you from your initial data to what you want to uh, map. No, 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 they're not. Like you can, for example, you can play around with the form of these transformations. We ended up like essentially trying to go for the simplest thing we could with the like least number of parameters. Um, but you can you can like stack different numbers of flows and stuff like that. Uh, there, I mean, every model has very different types of transformations. For what we were doing, we found, for example, that some were suboptimal. But like, if you look at machine learning papers that look at these, you know, trying to generate faces and so on and so forth, like you'll see that a lot of them they succeed to different uh, degrees. But you can you can use all of them. So for one transformation, it's not it's not said to be unique. Correct. Uh, that's what, okay. That is one thing. And uh, uh, the next question is if uh, the intermediate steps of the, the transformation, uh, are they physical? Or maybe physical this- Physical in what sense? Uh, is, is, it, is it physics or is it real? I mean, can it be a real scenario? Um, I guess you could if you wanted to. Um, we definitely didn't do that. Um, like you really just, you give this to a neural network and it does its own thing. But in principle, you could like, um, if you look at some of the like first papers on normalizing flows, um, there they try to like, they actually try to kind of give a bit of like physical intuition behind the, trans the types of transformations that they use. Um, so that paper might be nice and you can actually see like how the different transformations like transform the PDFs and so on. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Beautiful talk anyway. Thank you. So many good questions. Any other questions for Anna? All right. Well, Anna, I think uh, those are all the questions. If anyone was being shy here at the end, I'm sure Anna would love a million emails from you with questions about her talk. Uh, we will post the video before too long. And uh, Anna, if you could send your slides so I can post the slides as well, that would be wonderful. It's a beautiful talk. So let's thank Anna one more time uh, in your room, maybe audibly clap, even if we can't do mm -hmm. it. Uh, and uh, thanks for the great talk. That was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Bye, everyone.